Coming up on Chopper's Politics. He's a nuisance, and I've got a challenge for him. Yep. Meet me in the boxing ring. Let's do three rounds. And if I win, he never protests out there again. <laughs> and if, if he wins, I'll go and protest with him. I'm Christopher Hope, the Associate Editor for Politics at the Daily Telegraph, and this is Chopper's Politics. Cake and politics are a heady mix. Boris Johnson was brought down by the absence or not of a cake at a birthday party during lockdown. And this week, Professor Susan Jebb, the chairman of the Food Standards Agency, likened bringing cake into the office to passive smoking in pubs when smoking was allowed. So this week, we're looking at whether politicians can have their cake and eat it too. Can Labour reach out enough to the right and not alienate the left as it seeks to present itself as a government in waiting? I'll discuss that with Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting. And Redwall Tory MP Lee Anderson joins us to talk about whether the South really needs money to level up and his attempt to shed one and a half stones by saying no to cake. And we'll have Baroness Stahl of Beeston, Tina Stahl, on the need to support our creative industries. And to get it all started, I brought along the last of the Hope family's Christmas cake in a small top of hair box. First up, Wes Streeting, Shadow Health Secretary. Wes, welcome to Chopper's Politics. Great to be, especially if you've given me some of your wife's Christmas I've cake, which is Christmas. delicious. It's delicious, yeah. Don't well, tell the times, though, because we're not allowed to have cake in the office, apparently. Well, well, what's your view on this? On this, I mean, that was, of course, the Times reporting what a public health official said about is it, is it a gateway drug to sugar now or something, cake? Is that the Wood Labour ban cake? Yeah, we could try. I don't think we'd succeed. I, I think we definitely didn't need to do more as a country to prevent ill health, and I think that's you know, about reducing smoking, reducing our sugar, salt intake and all the rest of it. But Labour doesn't want to be the fun police. (laughs) And I think that, you know, bringing a bit of cake into the office is not altogether a bad thing. Maybe shoveling loads of cake all day, every day is a bad thing. But, you know, I'm, I'm really conscious in this sort of space of public health of trying to make it as easy as possible for people to do the right thing and as affordable as possible for people to do the right thing. Uh, but, you know, I don't think lay- a Labour government will be banning cake. Thank you. Well, sorry, let's, sorry let's to end, any, let's, anyone out there. Let's the end the podcast that, now and I'm go home. I'm sorry to the because, cake banning uh, community that I haven't been able to support you on this one. That's the that's, that's the top line that's now. So you're here to talk about the NHS, West Street, because you're the Shadow Health Secretary. When did the NHS stop being the envy of the world? Well, certainly pre-pandemic, because... We'd gone into the pandemic with NHS waiting lists already at a record four and a half million, 100,000 staff short and 112,000 vacancies in social care. So while, of course, COVID has made everything much more difficult and there are issues that are seasonal, like the big flu that's sweeping through the country, the, the fact is that we would have been able to weather those storms better had the NHS been in better shape going in. And it is frustrating to see the legacy that the last Labour government left in the NHS, which was the shortest waiting times and the highest patient satisfaction in history, effectively squandered Mm. by the Tories. And I think we've got to learn the right lessons from that. Um, Andrew Lansley's massive top-down reorganisation, described as so big you could see it from space, I think wasted a hell of a lot of time and money, Mm. caused a huge amount of disruption and his successors as Conservative Health Secretaries have spent years Unwinding unscrambling it. all of it. And they can't what a waste do. of time and money. What the um, advisors to successive health secretaries have told me is that running the NHS is like being in charge of a franchise in the sense that you're in charge of the brand, but you have no actual control over how it's administered. So you're blamed for the mistakes, say, in, in, in Luton, in a commissioning group, but, but it's all blamed on you. But you have no control, so you're there trying to deal with this problem, but it's all outsourced. Would they ever bring it more back under direct control of Whitehall? I think that there are things that government needs to do to create the conditions for the NHS to succeed. Workforce is the obvious one. I do think one of the challenges that I think is in inflicted by politicians in Westminster is a lack of serious workforce planning. And that's why, alongside the biggest expansion of NHS staff in history, doubling the number of medical school places, 10,000 more nursing and midwifery clinical training places every year, 5,000 more health visitors, that's all the things we would do, funded by abolishing the non-DOM tax status, because yeah. we think if you make Britain your home, you should pay your taxes here. We would put in place independent workforce planning so that the NHS knows the staff it needs. Government are given 
the transparent, objective information in much the same way they're given on the OBR. And if ministers aren't willing to step up, you know, they can't stick their head in the sand or pretend they didn't know. And so there'll be a bit more accountability, I think, because we've got this absurd situation we saw last summer. Straight A students in Britain, straight A students wanting to study medicine turned away at the same time as Britain's recruiting more doctors and nurses from overseas. And we've got medical schools. We've got one at Brunel, I think another one that's um, potentially going to be in the same position of only recruiting international students to study medicine Mm. and no opportunities for homegrown talent. And I think that's a disgrace. So away from workforce planning, the um, NHS is currently spending around 7% of its money with the private sector. And that hasn't really moved since Labour was in charge. Was the Tories' problem not to increase that number? I think as a a short-term measure, certainly, because the message we've had from private providers is there is capacity to do a significant number of of operations. We we did some analysis on this. And I mean, even if I'm being more conservative than our estimate, I think you could do tens of thousands, if not well over 100,000, 200,000 additional operations through the private sector. That's now, the NHS now. And that's now. And that's that's controversial with some people on the left for reasons I perfectly understand. They don't want to see taxpayers' money going into private healthcare. Like me, they believe in an NHS as a public service. But... My sort of take on this is, how could I look someone in the eye... Who's in pain. Who's in pain, who's waiting, can't afford private health care, but their next door neighbour can and is being seen faster. How could I look that person in the eye and say, I'm really sorry, but because of my left-wing principles, I'm going to leave you waiting longer, even though I could use the NHS to fund your private treatment. So that's, that's why I've taken that sort of pragmatic... The left won't like that, Wes. Approach. No, they don't. But, uh, you know, if we're having an argument about principles, I don't think there's anything principled about working class people being left behind while those who can afford it get seen faster. And I think that's how we deal with things in the short term. In the longer term, we've got to end up in a position where, yes, we're investing in the NHS, but we're also reforming the way it works. Because I think one of the reasons why the NHS does not perform as well as other countries now is... We spend, I think, pretty much top of the table in the OECD on spending in hospitals, but we are near the bottom, at the bottom, seriously lagging behind on things like primary care, community services, mental health, diagnostics, capital. And it should be the other way around, because Mm. if you can get to people faster, easier access, faster diagnosis, therefore faster treatment, you end up with better health outcomes and better value for taxpayers' money. Because we're in this terrible situation at the moment where because people can't get a GP appointment, which would probably cost about 40 quid on average, they end up in A&E, which can cost around 360 quid on average. So we are spending money in the wrong places. And that's why reform is needed, not just more investment. The idea that we can of, of allowing patients to go straight to consultants or experts and bypassing the GPs, that's still current policy. It was it was criticised, wasn't it, after it came out? It has been criticised. I think partly because I think people saw the headline and assumed that we would have a free for all, where you know Doctor Google could just send you off to a very expensive specialist who's already overwhelmed. Absolutely not going to do that. But there, I think there are some specific cases where if it's clinically sound and safe, a route for self referral would, I think, lead to better faster treatment and better outcomes for patients That's the point. and better value you for want to tax get care quicker. Um, yeah. So for example on gynecology, we've got women waiting around seven and a half years for an endometriosis diagnosis. This is completely intolerable. What if we had gynecology pop up clinics in the community where women could go in and get seen faster? Labour's got a fully costed, fully funded plan to set up mental health hubs in every community. Now if they existed, that would divert loads of patients away from overstretched GPs to see mental health practitioners straight away and that would i think lead to better outcomes for patients and better value for taxpayers money and gps who you know tell us they're struggling would have some capacity freed up you know i don't understand why when labor's floating ideas for reform the conservative party is basically coming out and saying no reform no we definitely don't need reform i just think the choice at the next election is going to be labor reformers versus conservative status quo and you know i think there's meant to be one of those gotcha letters that ministers send to their opponents neil o'brien the conservative health minister sent me a letter last week basically saying that the primary care model is working well (laughs) I mean, (laughs) no one believes that. No, tell that to one in seven people that couldn't get a GP appointment. Tell that to two million people Mm. who've waited more than a month. Would Labour support some kind of royal commission looking at it? Because the problem with the NHS is it's a political football. Why not just get a kind of 
it might be turned into a deal not inquiry, by the way, and won't never be implemented. But well, I mean, that is the challenge, isn't it? We've asked lots of really great people to do some good reports, but unless governments listen, what difference does it make? Mm. What I'd like to do, and the reason why we are flying some policy kites now, and we are leading this reform debate is I want people to kick the tyres on our ideas. I want people to challenge. I want people to offer alternatives. And I want to do that hard thinking now so that when a Labour government comes in, and I hope that will be after the next general election, we've got a plan to hit the ground running on day one because we've got to do two things immediately. Grip the immediate crisis in the NHS at the same time as making the right long-term decisions and so want, that the NHS want, is fit Labour for the future. Labour would, Labour would, would lose this distaste for using the private sector in, in the NHS. That seems to be your message. Well, I mean, the last Labour government did it really well. And, you know, ironically, <laughs> for the people who criticised it, um, the use of the private sector by the end fell. Why? Because the Labour government made the NHS so good that people didn't feel forced to What level to are you private. happy with? I mean, it's 7% at the moment. What level are you happy with spending well, I don't think the it's about. Sector? I don't think it's about having an arbitrary number. I think it's about being pragmatic pragmatic, hard-headed, using taxpayers' money wisely to get the best outcomes for patients. That's what matters to me without, you know, playing the greatest hits. I remember Mm. the last Labour government saying what matters is what works. I I think that will be the approach of the next Labour government. And our ambition remains the same. I don't want to wag my finger at people Mm. who go private. What I do want to do is make sure the NHS is so good that no one ever feels forced to go private. As an observer at all, I do wonder why the voice of the patient is often not even in the conversation. It's well, I mean, unions versus employees. And and that's where you're putting yourself, it seems to me. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I will see it as one of my crowning achievements as a health secretary if... By the end of my time as health secretary, the patient voice is as powerful and influential as why, the BMA why, or the why Royal Colleges. It? Where, where, where there was something called the Patients Association in the old days. Well, they're, they're not, still be going. They're not as well resourced. I mean, you know, I don't say this as criticism, you know, even though I've had some disagreements with the BMA over some issues in recent months. I think one of the strengths of the profession, you know, you've got Royal Colleges, which bring together expert communities of, of, of practice. You've got unions like the BMA, the Royal College of Nursing, Unison, GMB and and the others. You've got a whole range of expert bodies, the think tanks, you've got NHS providers, you've got NHS Confederation, but the people that are missing are the patients. And I see it as my job to be the patient's champion. That is that is the job description, I think, for any good health secretary. How would you end the nurses strike and the ambulance driver strike? Uh, get them around the table immediately, negotiate that's, that's and pay, easy negotiate say. on... The, well, you say it's easy, Chris, but it, in fact, it's because it's easy that I think it's so maddening that the government haven't done it. And I can honestly say, if we'd got to this point now where we've got another lot of strikes announced, I think next month we might see the biggest strike in the history of the NHS. Cover the first. And I hadn't even sat down to negotiate. I think Keir Starmer would be hauling me into Downing Street and saying, what the hell are you playing at? You get them around the table and sort this Who, out. Do you, do you blame Steve fired. Barkley, the, the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt? It's, there's clear tension, isn't it, on this? Yeah, and I think, again, this is part of the challenge for the Conservatives and has been for months now, and even with a new Prime Minister... I think it's the internal paralysis of the Conservative Party that's holding our country back. And I don't pretend it's easy, not least because the Conservatives have crashed the economy and left the public finances in a mess. But I think what Jeremy Hunt's got to really... And look, he, I pick on Jeremy Hunt for a minute because he's former Health Secretary and now Chancellor. And when he was the chair of the Health Select Committee, I thought he said some quite interesting and self-critical things. We've got to see the pay dispute not just about fairness to the staff and cost of living, but as a retention issue. And my worry about the nurses in particular, but I think it applies to the doctors and the paramedics too, is that they don't just walk out for another day, they walk out altogether. And we can't afford to lose staff, which is why, I mean, the the legislation they put forward in Parliament, it was an absurdity, as if they're going to sack nurses or paramedics or junior doctors for For going on strike. And it's also absurd to say, you know, Rishi Sunak at Prime Minister's Questions this week was saying, you know, why aren't you supporting minimum standards on strike days? Rishi, why aren't you delivering minimum standards on any day of the week? And can we sack you? Conservatives seem to be spending lots of time trying to make strikes work and I think the idea is that strikes shouldn't happen. And so you've got to do the work to prevent people going on strike. In the Are first you place. flattered by all your, your supporters saying you should be Labour leader? No, I do you know. I think that is that that sort of nonsense is sort of dead and buried. We're and in the pub. It's you and me talking now, Wes. No one's listening. <laughs> um, no, I think that Keir Starmer doesn't get nearly enough credit for the transformation he's led in the Labour Party. And I think people can see under Keir's leadership, the Labour Party has changed. 
Um, you don't make an omelette without breaking some eggs, mm. and Keir has done that. Yeah. The Labour Party's in a much, much more sensible place, I think, has really understood why we lost. And for me, the last Labour conference we had, which obviously I think people like you guys, who veterans of, of party conferences over the years, had noticed the change. Do you know, for me, the, the most exciting thing about that change wasn't the speeches from the platform. Great though our speeches were, you know, I highly recommend Keir's and Rachel's and mine <laughs> and, and the yours. rest of the gang, obviously. But it was actually the conference floor mm, and the, the, the things that they clapped. And, you know, I remember Rachel Reeves at one point was talking about the importance of spending money wisely and our economic credibility. And she was being cheered from the rafters by Labour members because they understood why we lost and they really want us to win and they really want and us to make a difference. you have to make, to make those difference. Georges. I, I, for me, I saw the suits replacing the cardigans. That's the way I described it amongst the audience and the crowd listening in. And it seems to me that the party is <clears throat> turning itself towards power in a way it hasn't done before. Yeah, I'm turning 40 this weekend, so I, I very much hope no one's bought me a cardigan for my birthday But now, why, so why, why is Keir Starmer lagging behind Rishi Sunak, though, and Trust and other areas? I mean, the party is, is doing well in the polls, but he personally isn't doing as well as he should be. I think Keir, I think Keir is doing well, actually, relative to other Labour leaders. I think he's doing well relative to Rishi Sunak. I think the more people see of Keir Starmer the more they like him. And I think as a party, we can't be complacent about that. I think our our recent party political broadcast, which featured a sort of one-on-one, very personal film with Keir, I think is great because that, that, that shows the country the Keir Starmer that I know and that gives me enormous confidence. Someone I like, someone I trust, someone I respect and someone I really like motivates me to work harder for him. How would you characterise Labour in terms of this political spectrum? Is it now a centrist party? We're a centre-left party. Um, We're a centre-left party building a big tent that I think disaffected, upset, angry Conservative voters are looking at the Labour Party and feeling increasingly safe. I thought it was fascinating recently when Rachel Reeves did a big interview um, in one of the weekend papers that George Osborne came out and said... Look, you know, I don't necessarily always agree with Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves. And I think I think he felt obliged to say, obviously, I want a Conservative government. I'm not sure he really feels like that at the moment. But he said, look, you, you, you wouldn't feel frightened of these people running the country. And I think that is really important that people can see we've got a serious leader, a serious team and a serious plan. And I want the Labour Party to be a party that former Conservative voters feel confident voting for, a party that Labour voters feel confident voting for. And that's the challenge for, for you. And I think we are building that big tent. And it's quite discombobulating, possibly, for the Tory party that you want to be you're in favour of more, maybe more pro- privatised work on the NHS. The, the party's policy last September was to cut the base rate of income tax to 19p, whereas the Tory party is now at 20p. Well, I think the Conservative Party... Uh, I think they've just run out of steam. Uh, They've run out of ideas. And after 13 years, five Conservative Prime Ministers, seven Conservative Health Secretaries, it's very hard for them to say to the country, uh, we've got this fresh vision, we've got fresh ideas, because they've heard it all before. And they can't defend their record. So they're sort of stuck in this no man's land of sort of being trapped by the status quo. Because if they reject the status quo, they're effectively admitting that they've you know, balls things up for the last 13 years. If they start setting out plans for the future, people say, well, you've had 13 years. Why is it going to be different this time? And I think that's the question people have to ask themselves now. After 13 years of Conservative government, are you better off than you were 13 years ago? Is your family better off? Is our country better off? Are our public services better off? Are our businesses better off? And I think the answer to all of those questions is no. And I ask people, and and I, I love doing stuff in your paper in particular, because I really want telegraph readers even those who have died in the war lifelong conservatives to give change a chance and vote labor what's the worst that can happen if you don't feel that we've made progress and delivered on our promises after one term boot us out but if we do deliver and you can see the country going in the right direction then you can keep us but i think after 13 years of the same old same old and every different shade of blue i think maybe it's time to give the alternative a look well, we're treating the Shadow Health Secretary. So thank you for joining us this week on Chopper's Politics Podcast and take your cake with you. Happy birthday. Thank you very much. We're streeting there. Coming up, Tory MP Lee Anderson, former coal miner and Labour supporter for 30 years and why he's taking back control of what he eats. Right after this. If you're finding this podcast interesting... 
You may also like our new daily podcast, Ukraine, the latest. Every weekday, The Telegraph's leading journalists bring you the latest news and the most informed analysis of President Putin's invasion of Ukraine. From our newsroom in London and from the ground. The Russian machine has been ground to a halt now for well over a week, and that is just staggering. NATO has to act now. It has to do more than it's currently doing. Otherwise, in this Ukrainian MP's words, you'll have to evacuate the whole continent. One video that we found to be incorrect was bomb squads seen in the Donbass region. The metadata of this clip shows that it was created in 2019, not today. Search Ukraine, the latest, in the same place you're listening to this, and click follow so you don't miss an update. And we're back. Now, Tory MP Lee Anderson, a former Labour supporter for 30 years, is one of the more interesting entrants to Parliament in the 2019 general election. He's a forthright former minor who always speaks his mind. He's also a staunch Brexiteer in Labour country. And this week he launched plans for his own version of taking back control, but this time of his diet. Lee Anderson, MP for Ashfield, welcome to Chopper's Politics Podcast. Thank you for having me. Lee, you're a straight-talking man from the East Midlands. I'm going to be straightforward with you. How heavy are you? 17 stone 2. I'm officially obese. But you're a big fella. You carry it well. I do. You know, I'm tall. I'm 6 foot 2. People say, no, no, you're not that weight, but I am. I can uh, confirm that was on the scales last Monday. <laughs> right. Uh, and I got the flight of my life because I did lose a bit of weight um, during during COVID, during lockdown. And because um, when Boris said you could exercise for an hour a day, yeah. I thought, well... That's instruction. That's an instruction. <laughs> so I did. And that's what I did. I was walking five, then 10 mile, and then up to 15 mile some yeah. days. Greeting uh, all the constituents, saying hello. It's, well, it's, it's funny because when you, go on your, <laughs> when you do a 10 mile walk around your constituency, lots of people stop you. So rather than being a three hour walk, it, it turns into a five, <laughs> six hour. So lots of people pipping their own, stopping you, chatting. Yeah. To, uh, what, but, what's uh, the target weight then? Uh, I want to get down to about 15 stone eight, 15 stone 10. That's right. when... I mean, that's still officially overweight, but that's what I feel comfortable at. And that's, mm. um, I've got a few shirts and suits in my wardrobe that uh, they need to be fitting me again. Yes, that's the target. Look at those clothes. Mm. Yes. I went on a diet after COVID and lost two stone. I called it my taking back control diet. Well, it's funny you should say that, Chopper, because uh, I'm going to adopt that logo. I want to take back control of my eating, my drinking, exactly. uh, and my own personal health. I've got a cup of tea here with no, no milk in, which is... I've got uh, milk in mine. That milk's a carbs, you told me before. Well, I've no been told. So it's, uh, I, I'm out with the carbs. Uh, but what I think also, there's an important message here, yes. Chopper, because... Our health service is struggling at the moment, and obesity is a massive problem in this country. People not looking after self, they seem to think that I can drink, I can smoke, I can live on the edge, I can do all these nasty, horrible things to my body, because it's okay, because if I do have a stroke or a heart attack or, you know, whatever, I can just go to NHS and get What's fixed. What's your view on banning cake, then, from offices? Well, it's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, we've, <laughs> we've, we've had racist gardening programmes, and now we've got killer cake <laughs> that's... Uh, <laughs> Infiltrating the workplace. Just pause that. So, so the, the garden, the garden is because of the language, like you call saying native species. Yeah, seen. yeah. We're living in a world now where everything's either racist or, or bad for you. Or bad but for do, you. So, do you think no? But on a point of, of obesity, I've got some. I've got some Christmas cake in my in my uh, for Mrs. Hope for you. I'm, I'm going to pop the table there and we'll look at it. But we won't touch it. Is that is that a gateway drug for you, Lee Anderson? That that, that is that's a slippery slope. <laughs> um, we're looking at some some cake here in some Tupperware box, aren't we? Yeah, it looks like Christmas cake, doesn't it? Is. It's uh, it looks nice actually. And, and at one time of day, the uh, the double cream would have been out on that. <laughs> Thirty seconds in microwave, and I would have wolfed it in me. But but do you believe on a serious point that that public health um, uh, expert this week said that, that that cake should be banned from offices? Do you? Or do you what I think do you... that public health chief should be sacked. Um, he, he probably needs um, a proper job. Yes, uh, she, to, she. Yeah. I mean, he, she. Sorry, the grief you've been getting is quite miserable, actually, isn't it? You announced, fair enough, your your weight and the rest on on the on the Twitter, and then someone posted some some mock up of some pork scratchings, saying Porky Lee scratchings. It takes five Tory MPs eczema to make each pack. Well, I've been this week. I've been called Lord Ass, pot bellied MP. I've been called a fat bastard, all over Twitter. Most of them are just uh, their hidden profiles. Uh, you know the cowards, the, the keyboard cowards. But I'm like this. You used to watch Popeye as a kid, because I did. <laughs> did and you? every time he had his tin of spinach, 
he, he got stronger. And that's what it's like for me every time I get one of these horrible comments. I like to think that uh, my haters are my motivators. Hmm. It's as simple as that. And you had this long running battle with a guy called Steve Bray who shouts at Tory MPs as they go about their business. And, you, and you, you're taking him on now? Well, I mean, I mean, he, he stand needs. He, he had to go at my weight. I mean, this is a, a man who's quite clearly out of condition. I'm trying to do something about it, but here's a challenge, Chopper. This is an exclusive. It's a nuisance, and I've got a challenge for him. Yep. Meet me in the boxing ring. Let's do three rounds. And if I win, he never protests out there again. <laughs> and if, if he wins, I'll go and protest with him. You're challenging Steve Bray to a fight? A boxing match. A boxing Queensbury match. Queensbury rules. Gloves. Gloves on for charity. Let's do some fundraising. Yep. Or whatever. Let's get some sponsorship. Right. Uh, and the money can go to one of my... T- if, if I win, like I say... He stopped protesting, but the money we raise can go to one of my charities. And at the moment, the charity on my mind is a suicide charity for, for young males. Exactly. A difficult time in January for lots of people. Well, we'll try and get hold of Steve Bray and we'll see what can happen. Very good. Just briefly, in other news, the Anderson, there's, there's some big levelling up money being spent around the country in England on Thursday. The Telegraph reports it as saying that Sunak pumps more money into South and they've compared the shares of levelling up fund between different regions compared to the first round under Boris Johnson and and now. It seems that more money is going down south. Does that make you happy or sad? Well, Chopper, you shouldn't believe everything you read in the paper, should you? It's the you? Telegraph, you it's the truth. Well, 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 look, I, I'm a happy bunny. Um, I'm the Member of Parliament for Ashfield. We've had £62.5 million pound Future High Streets Fund, £6.75 million pound High Streets Fund. Two new score rebuilds. One of them scores is my old score. The other score is in, is in the town where I live. And I've had extra money from our hospital, which is the largest employer in my constituency. And hopefully we're going to get a railway, a new railway line, the main Marion yep. line, which is part of the integrated rail plan. So thank you, Boris. Thank you, Rishi. Thank you, Conservative government. So he gets levelling up. You did say those remarks, didn't you, how when he was in Tunbridge Wells, he was asked about levelling up and he talked about the need to levelling up parts of Kent. Yeah, we should, we should be levelling up the, the whole part of the country. Even the, what people sometimes call the posher, richer Tory constituency, they've got pockets of deprivation in there. Mm. Uh, and you know, we need to levelling them, uh, them areas up as well. So you understand that? You don't think there's, he's trying to put money in to secure the base just to avoid a massive defeat in the election why, next why year? Why would he do that? It's nonsense. It's, it's political nonsense. Is it true, Lee Anderson, that the first time you voted Conservative for an MP was for... Well, for you, or was it a local no, MP? Because um, you were a former Labour councillor. Yeah, I was. And um, I, I'd lived in Ashfield all my life. And we, we moved to Mansfield after selling a house. And um, I voted for Ben Bradley. And then when I got selected as, as the candidate, I said, the first thing I said to the missus was, if I win, we're putting the house up for sale the same day and I'm moving back to Ashfield, which I did. I won. And, and the day after, the house went up for sale. And you know, for the last 18 months, I've been back in Ashfield, loving it. I mean, you've never lived more than five miles from your home, have you? All, of, right. all of your life. You yeah. are born and bred in, yeah. in Ashfield, Mansfield, not. Yeah. Do you see Labour making gains there? I mean, it should be Labour territory and has been in the past. And well, was we've the past. always been. I mean, I was a coal miner for many years, as was my dad and my granddad. And it was always traditional labour. It was unionised. It was it was coal mining. It was textiles, etc. So the Labour Party had what we term as useful idiots. That's what we were really. We paid the subs. We paid to the NUM. That went into the Labour Party. Blah blah blah, etc. And you know it was a captive audience for the Labour Party. We just did it. We vote Labour. That's what we do. Tories are nasty. They're horrible. Um, and my political journey took about thirty five years for the penny to drop from from being a Labour Party member at age sixteen when Michael Footwood mm-hmm. was the leader. And then finding myself working for a Labour MP in Ashfield in 2013, that's when I really discovered what the Labour Party was all about. Mm. You know, they were at our Labour group meetings, instead of talking yeah. about potholes and, and, and housing and deprivation. But can talk- you hang on to your seat, do you think, next election? Yes, your uh, I think majority I can. is 5,800. I think I can because um, a lot of my voters made that same journey as me. They voted Conservative for the very first time. Now, there was three yeah. things. There was Boris, there was, there was Brexit, there was, there was Jeremy Corbyn. That was, that was a great campaign. Mm. We haven't got that this time. Mm. That's so, the risk. So, you know, I've, I always go native. I put my patch first. I say the things that most people want to say but don't say in that place over there. And basically what I do, and I think I do well, is I say what most people are thinking. Do you worry about all this... this um the trans row now engulfing the Tory party. This is about uh, banning trans conversion therapy. Look, there is, there's a big debate about this in that place. But you know what, uh, Chopper? You know when you knock on doors in places like Ashfield, nobody brings this up. It's, it's another case of out of touch Westminster, the bubble, the journos, the politicians, the, whoever. They're talking about nonsense 
that nobody else in the rest of the country... Is it a distraction, do you think? From it's a massive distraction. Mm-hmm. I mean, nobody talks... Nobody comes up to me in the middle of the high street in Kirby, Nashville, and say, hey, oh, what about this conversion therapy? Nobody. Because most people don't understand it, not, they don't know about it, and quite frankly... Fact, it's, important, it's important to minority people, it is. of course. We accept that there is a minority with, with, with gender dysmorphia. Mm. We, we know that, but it's, it's a tiny minority of the population, and we're turning 90% of the debate into something that affects... 0.01% of whatever it is. Yeah. Yes, we should care. Yes, we should help these people. But stop this distraction politics. It's nonsense. Mm. And just finally, Anderson, as a former Labour Party supporter for 35 years, as you said, would you ever go back? No. Definitely I, 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 not. Listen, you, Chopper, listen. You it's, never switch sides. You're gone. You, you look, the one thing that scares me, when I sit on them green benches, I look at the, the opposition. I mean, the SNPs, they're, they're just balmy. But you look at the Labour MPs, and you think, my goodness, you know, in 18 months' time, there could be another 100 of them. That is scary for this country, and it's scary for my children, and it, it worries me to death. Well, the answer, MB for Ashfield. Let's see if you're less of the man you are now when we next meet. And I'll get the gloves on. Thanks for joining us on Chopper's Politics Podcast. Thank you. Lee Anderson there. Now, this week, the Lords Communications Committee published a report on the UK's creative industries and why the Treasury is ignoring them at its peril. Why, with more investment and focus in Whitehall, they could become the uh, cherry on top of the UK's cake. Okay, you get my drift. Anyway, it's a big, important issue. With me now in the pub is Baroness Stowell of Beeston, the chair of that Lord's Communications Committee. Baroness Stowell of Beeston, welcome to Chopper's Politics Podcast. Great to have you on. You're the chair, chair of the Lord's Communications Committee. Yeah. So you're oversight of the creative industries, the broadcasting, the BBC. You had a report out this week, didn't you? And your big concern is that we don't respect or the, the policymakers don't really understand the sector that you're worried about. Yeah, I mean, the, the creative industries have been a hugely successful part of our economy over the last decade or so and, and more. I mean, they've contributed massively. I mean, in the UK alone, their value is uh, about £116 billion mm. by 2020. They've been responsible for three times the rate of growth of jobs mm. than uh, the, the most parts of the economy. And globally now, the creative industries is incredibly competitive and uh, a lot of countries have seen how well the UK has been doing and are copying what, what we've yeah. done in terms of you know tax reliefs, On, that sort of thing. It's seen as a tax break story, isn't it, for a lot of people? Well, yeah, yeah. The filmmaking. But, but what's happened now is the international competition is growing and uh, we're in danger of being sort of complacent and a bit asleep on the you know the wheel mm. in allowing the creative industries to sort of slip back, as it were, and really what they should be is front and centre of the government's growth strategy. And it was it was disappointing that in the Chancellor's five priorities or the Prime Minister's five priorities in the autumn statement, this part of the economy didn't even feature. And we, we're baffled as to, to why. And I think there are, there are various things that are happening which are you know, hard to understand, really, and reflect, I yeah. think, a lack of seriousness within Whitehall in terms of attitude towards, you know, towards... Because it's where it's going, industry. isn't it? And, you know, as we move away from being a manufacturing economy into more of exactly. services and... Exactly, exactly. And, um, you know, if we think about the manufacturing economy of old and how we allowed the Far East to eat our lunch, as it were, and, mm. you know, we sort of allowed them to become quicker and cheaper at producing stuff, if we're not careful, the yes. Far East is going to be doing the same when it comes to our creative Is it not seen as a serious industry? Are there, are there too many media studies courses? It's seen as a kind of way of a, being well, critical of a light, lightweight Yeah, I think, there's, I think there's still a bit of a, a throwback Snobbery. to that. Yeah, a bit of, possibly. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm quite sympathetic to the argument that people shouldn't go to university who don't need to go in order to get a decent job and get on in life. And we shouldn't be encouraging youngsters to get into debt by doing courses that are not going to help them but if we just go on about that all the time what we are also in danger of doing is discouraging young people from doing creative arts type training which is going to be essential to the future success of our creative economy you know and I think that's something which is not being properly understood. Yes. It's a bit. It's a bit lazy, you yes. know. And it, as I say, it's another way of reflecting, I think, or illustrating the the lack of importance that is attached to to this part of our 
economy. Is there a disconnect, do you think, between it's seen as a, a sort of left-wing bias in the creative arts, the media, that sector, against the Tory party? Is that is that where the problem is, if there's a problem? Um I don't know whether that's sort of how significant a factor that is. I yes. think there's probably a bit of that. I think there's there's sort of layers, really. I mean, I don't know about you, Chris, but when mm. I was growing up, you know, if you were a young person, a teenager, and sort of saying, oh, well, you know, I want to be an artist or I want to be a an actor or, or whatever it might be, you know, people <laughs> would say, oh, don't be daft, get a proper job. Don't be daft, you know. And I think that it's also <laughs> true that, uh, you know, in education policy terms, yeah. The priority has got to be making sure that we equip young people with the basics in terms of English, maths, and uh, there's been an awful lot of attention, understandably, on science and what have you. But by doing all of that, what we're sort of failing to do is, is properly understand the career opportunities now are massive in the creative industries. And by not equipping people mm. to take advantage of those opportunities, we are denying them sort of real success and prospects and denying our own economy and our own success as a nation by not understanding those skills, needs, gaps, shortages, and making sure that we address them. And I know you hear a lot about skills shortages across all sorts of different industries, but um, what we're saying is you need to really understand the skill shortages in the creative industries, understand the need for a blend of, of technical, digital with creative, and understanding that is going to put us in a strong position to not just maintain our leading role in the creative industries globally, but also make sure that we're not overtaken. Because when you look at the charts, as it were, for global exports, when it comes to services, Germany is way out ahead. We're number five, not bad, but you know we've got the Netherlands right behind us. And when you look at creative goods in terms of exports, Italy, France and Germany are ahead of us. And the country that is nipping at our heels is Vietnam. Right. You know, I mean, we need to take this seriously. Is part of the problem that there have been too many ministers? I mean, 35 ministers for the area in 25 years. I mean, the Minister for Fun was the idea which yeah. David Mellon raised. The idea that it's just it's a bit of fun, no, the I mean, sector, rather than being a serious thing to worry about. I think that that still permeates. And I think one of the best illustrations of that was I read over Christmas Harry Cole and James Heal book oh, on yes. this trust. And when they recount her putting together her cabinet, she was apparently uh, remarking on the competition for DCMS. There was Kemi, there was Michelle Donnan, and even Nadine was not sure whether she wanted to stay, I think, or go. Nadine Dorries. And apparently Liz was reported to have said something like, you know, why do they all want this? Why don't they want a proper department? And I think <laughs> that just captures yes. you know that sort of sense that it's still sort of not seen as what it is a department that's responsible for a massive part of not just our national life but our economy do, do, do you think is it too is it is it an exclusive sector one which it's hard to get into if you're from the other parts of the, of the country where there's less of a kind of cultural base um, I worry think. Uh, I mean, I th <clears throat> you're, I th from, you're from the Nottingham show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I think there is. I suppose anecdotally, I would say. I mean, I haven't looked at the sort of you know evidence of this, but anecdotally, you know, this creative sort of industries is something that you would not necessarily, you know, in my part of the world, hear people encourage their kids, I suppose, into because they wouldn't see it and understand it as a lucrative career. But that's part of the problem because now it is so broad in um, the opportunities that it offers. And it is, in fact, a, a fantastic way of addressing sort of you know, inequalities and, you know, a potential big levelling up solution. And part of the problem, and we say this in our report, is that poor careers advice which is available to young people at school and a lack of understanding of the opportunities that are available and that's something that does mm. need to be addressed because I think if we can do that and you don't need no. to go to university to get on in this industry either you know whether you want to be a, an electrician uh, working on a set to you know makeup artist to you know all sorts of different I mean it's just vast Looking back on your, your long career in, in Whitehall and Westminster, you were a former leader of the House of Lords. What did you make of uh, Keir Starmer's plans to overhaul it? Um, well, I think 
I think it's sort of, you know, a big ambition that's never going to be fulfilled, really. So I can understand why, you know, he might raise it as a bit of a distraction from other more important pressing matters. I mean, he I wants think... to abolish the House of Lords, he said, hasn't he, to restore trust in politics? Yeah, I mean, I'm not... Uh... I mean, I'm not sure that that is the... I mean, to me, if to restore trust in politics, what is really necessary, and whether it's the Commons or indeed the House of Lords, is for Parliament itself to get better at meeting the expectations and needs of voters. We don't necessarily need to change everybody in the place. What we need is the people who exist already to take more seriously and be more respectful of the people whose interests we exist to serve. And, you know, just before Christmas, the Archbishop of Canterbury had his annual debate in the House of Lords and he chose uh, asylum and immigration as his topic. And I spoke in that debate and I made the point that in the Nationality and Borders Bill that um, had been in Parliament earlier last year, which was the one where, you know, we'd sought to introduce the laws that would allow us to uh, re- direct people to Rwanda and, you know, stronger sort of uh, protections uh, against illegal immigration. I mean, that bill got mauled in the House of Lords and a lot of those who opposed it and objected to it did so on the basis that the people who were wanting these tighter controls didn't understand that it was sort of immigration was a good thing or, or whatever the case may be. And I thought, well, you know, actually, it's our job to understand what the people want. What the people and want. reflect that. Yes. Just finally, we're looking into quite a, a busy time for the House of Lords. You've got the uh, retained EU law bill passed through third reading last night, Wednesday night, in the House of Commons, going to the House of Lords. You've maybe got the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, which may, may come into the House of Lords. And there's forecasting of a lot of um, to and fro between the Lords and the Commons and, and Lords trying to oppose some of these measures. What's your warning to the House of Lords and peers there? Because some of that is in manifesto, certainly on the minimum strike, uh, strike laws was in the actual manifesto in 2019. I mean, there's going to be big battles, aren't there, going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think on, so I think on the minimum uh, strike issue, that, as you say, is in the manifesto, and therefore that is legislation that there is a mandate for. I mean, don't get me wrong, every piece of legislation is improved by the scrutiny it gets mm. f- from the House of Lords. I, I'm a great believer in that. I think we we collectively do a decent job. I do think our scrutiny and the work that we do is important. I mean, I'm sure it will get quite a lot of, of heat, but I think people are frustrated um, with the fact that, you know, public services are sort of, you know, able to go on strike in a way which is not conscious of the need to continue to meet certain standards. And I think that's important that we recognise. As for the EU bill, I think that one's slightly different in that there is that sort of tension between what the government is seeking to do, which is to perhaps take more powers to itself. Yes. Um, rather than sort of allow Parliament to do its proper job in yes. scrutinising some of this stuff. So that's one where it's a bit more... Fine, so the, the Lords can speak up at some point and it's just oh, gauging yeah, that... Yeah, I'm not trying to sort of say that the House of Lords should not be doing its job effectively. I'm saying yeah. that um, the way in which it does its job also has to respect the people with whom... It might not agree. And that's the, that's the issue. Well, Tina Stowell, uh, Baroness Stowell of Beeson, thank you for joining us this week on Chopper's Politics Podcast. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks, Chris. Well, that's all for this week, listeners, from the Red Lion Pub. I'd love to get your thoughts on what our guests had to say. Please email me, chopperspolitics at telegraph.co.uk or on Twitter, we're at Chopper's Podcast. Thank you to my guests, Wes Streeting, Lee Anderson, and of course, Baroness Stahl. Thank you to my producers, Louisa Wells and Giles Gear. But most importantly of all, as ever, thank you to you for listening. For more Westminster Insights delivered straight into your email inbox every weekday, please sign up for my Chopper's Politics newsletter. The link for that will be in the show notes to this episode. As will the link for my weekly Peterborough Diary gossip column, out every Friday at 7pm online and in Saturday's newspaper. And as ever, please do buy a copy of the Daily Telegraph. It's great value and a great read. And you always learn something. Until next time, though, there's some cake left. I'm going to nick it. Cheerio!